We have the, um, the final panel. I know we were standing here between you and lunch, so we will uh, try to make this a very efficient and effective and hopefully uh, one that is enlightening. And the topic that we are going to be talking about, I know we've heard a lot here already today about kind of where the state of maybe of entrepreneurism is, where the state of venture capital is moving, kind of where that we, and, and Congressman, you weren't here to hear, but uh, some of it was due dire. Uh, some of it was uh, really uh, talking about the shift and change of where we are seeing the venture dollars going in this incredible global competitiveness in which the United States is actually losing some of its market share, losing some of its competitive age. And we're here tonight to, to try to maybe stop, take a step back from admiring the problem and see if there are ways in which we can address. And some of those different things through either legislatively, through city initiatives, through federal legislation, or other through the courts and other means, are there ways in which we can try to restore back some of this American competitiveness and bring it back into the power of the entrepreneur and the founder and kind of the innovation network in which we have built so so greatly here in America. So I want to start, and Congressman, I'm going to start with you. Um, you obviously have a unique background in that you were not just a professional politician. Uh, we have had the pleasure of, of meeting you before and learning a little bit about your background, former Goldman Sachs, also your work in Latin America and other things in kind of a, a little broader range. You know, when I, um, both Bobby and I worked and had the pleasure of working in the Senate, uh, it was the institution where many people say all good ideas go to die. Um, and so it is a challenging environment, but you bring a, a different lens. You don't bring a necessarily a pure political lens to it. Talk to us a little bit on the atmospheric of what Washington looks like right now and kind of any appetite it might have to look and examine and work on solutions. Okay. <laughs> a little broad. A little broad. Okay. Um, let, let me start with a note that maybe, uh, and I'm sorry I missed the morning, but maybe a tad discordant with this idea that the United States is in a huge competitive decline. I'm not quite sure how it was framed, but um, look, I, 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 I'm going to have a narrow complaint about the dissemination of innovation around the world, but I have a much more general, uh, you know, applause and appreciation for that, right? Um, you know, the economic gains that have been made worldwide in the last two generations are probably one of the great achievements of mankind. You know, the, na you know, the nation of India with one billion people, what has happened economically in Southeast Asia, this is great. Um, and the idea that, you know, India and China and Southeast Asia and Korea were going to develop as rapidly as they remarkably, as ra rapidly as they did, and of course, you know, Africa and Latin America are moving in that direction, and that they were somehow going to stop short of the, you know, innovation and intellectual capital-driven uh, uh, wealth that, that, is, uh, that is the United States and Europe today, uh, that's both wrong, uh, you know, it's, it's wrong as a matter of economic fact, and it's wrong as a sort of ethical matter. I mean, why would we want any country out there stuck in a, you know, hard uh, asset uh, uh, manufacturing-oriented economy? The narrow complaint I have, and then I promise I will answer the question, the thing we do need to be careful about is that we need to not score our own goals, right? We need not, we should not do things that reduce our competitiveness, which is what we're doing right now with respect to immigration, with respect to investment in the future in all of its forms, infrastructure, investing in, 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 in education. We shouldn't harm ourselves in a much more competitive world. Um, and let me come back to that real quickly, but the other very narrow complaint I have is, look, I, I, I really don't want the, and this is, this is, I understand, paradoxical to what I just said, but I don't want the Chinese invent in quantum computing before we do. I don't want all of our encryption and all of our nuclear codes exposed to technology that is developed elsewhere. This is the who should develop the atom bomb first, the Nazis or, or the Allies. But that's a, for, that's a fairly narrow, narrow uh, concern. Um, so to the own goals thing, um, y y there, uh, there are policy answers. Um, if you look at the 3.8 trillion-ish government uh, spending um, very, very little of it is about investment in any of the drivers that create a Palo Alto or Route 128. Education, infrastructure, all the things that make people want to live and innovate in those places. Uh, half the, 
of federal spending is social insurance, actually in excess of half, and that's great. I'll, I'll happily lose my seat defending those programs, Medicare and Social Security, but we are not investing the way we should be investing, and that's a policy question. Then we have a political question, which is that, like, the, like much of the rest of the world, we're caught up in an isolationist, anti-immigrationist, dare I say, bigoted, maybe even racist moment. And it's not just us. I mean, it's Poland, it's Hungary, it's Russia. Um, for reasons that are well beyond the scope of what we have a time to talk about here, I, I suspect a lot of people are looking at the United States from everything from tourism to do I want to live there as an engineer to do I want to go to school there and saying that's a pretty unfriendly environment. And that we really had better change because if we're perceived as an unfriendly environment in which to succeed, uh, we will really do ourselves some harm. And I know you can't look at it, uh, you can't really look at the crystal ball, or you can look into it, but the outcome is still unknown, especially given the outcome of 2016, when all prognosticators of the election pretty well got it wrong. Um, obviously, we're going into a midterm election. Um, there are a lot of different seats in play. There is obviously dissatisfaction on the one hand, perhaps, of the president, but yet very much enjoying the, the economy of where it's at. If you had to kind of look at November, and you are chair of the New Democrat Coalition, this is a coalition of more, would you call moderates, or those that are pro, um, more, a little bit more pro-business, or a little bit more as far as that. Looking at November, where do you see the Congress settling out? Where does your coalition go? And are, are those the change makers needed to perhaps bring in some more innovation-friendly policies? Well, the, the 51 day answer to that question, because in 51 days we'll know the answer to what happens on election day. Um, but the 51 day answer is there's a very high probability that the Democrats retake the House. There's a, there's a small probability that the Democrats retake the Senate, and of course the President will be the President. So, you know, that points to uh, a Congress that is doing oversight, a Congress in which ideas are back in play. The dynamic in Washington right now is a lot of very scared Republicans that control the Congress, scared because, you know, if the president takes them on on Twitter, their careers could be over. The dynamic will change, uh, assuming that the outcome is what I just outlined, the dynamic will change because people will say, whoa, quite a reaction against that thing that we so feared. Um, and so I'm actually an optimist about that. I think that opens the door for some somebody like me to, God help me, go to the White House and say, Mr. President, look, we both want to get some things done here. You campaigned on a trillion dollar infrastructure plan. Let's do it. Nothing will help the people of southwestern Connecticut quite as much as that. And that's huge. Um, the longer term answer, but I'm going to make it short, um, the longer term answer is why is the world angry at immigrants? Why are we backward looking? Why are we governing ourselves through fear rather than through aspiration? There's a lot of reasons. And we have a whole de debate. One of the big reasons is, um, and this is why I feel pretty passionately about, I'm glad there's more venture capital activity and innovation around the world, too many people are being left behind. And the process of leaving people behind and the acceleration of that process um, is partly why we're in the political mess we're in today, partly why the president is the president. Um, and it's not getting better unless we really start addressing it. I, I, I'm not an apocalypse guy, apocalypse guy on this, but, you know, the dislocation uh, that we've experienced for 200 years is going to accelerate exponentially with AI and with greater permeation of, of automation and stuff. And nobody, except for the New Democrats, thank you very much, is really thinking about how do we, how do we, edu how do we turn education into, from something where you come to NYU and get a piece of paper after four years and then you're done to, boy, every single year you better update those skills. Why is it four years at NYU, by the way, instead of three years in, in person and one, one year online? You know, we're really trying to rethink the training models that will hopefully address what's driving our politics, which is too many people being left behind. Julia, I want to talk to you. You run uh, Tech NYC, and you have really been on the ground uh, here in the city, in the state, really at the grassroots level, trying to effectuate change on behalf of entrepreneurs and founders. Uh, one of the issues that we've all known is this access to talent and immigration being one of them. You, when the president first uh, made the first ban on uh, 
from those uh, individuals who are coming from select countries, you organize a letter. Uh, you organize the entire tech community here in New York and actually across the country to stand up and have a, a very strongly worded statement against the president and the policy. Talk to me a little bit about how how effective that is and are you ignoring the federal? I can you change with the power of a letter and, and the effectiveness of the, the, the ability to get those who sign? So, listen, is a letter going to change the policy? No. And in fact, it, it didn't, right? In fact, the policy is, is the policy. Um, but I think that it has it has real impact. I think to kind of build on and echo what the congressman was talking about, we send a message. And I think particularly while Congress and D.C. has been gummed up, shall we say, we've seen a lot of really interesting things happening at this local level, at the state level. And, and some of that comes actually from government, and a lot of it comes from community. And I think when our community, the, the original travel ban was signed, I believe, on a Friday afternoon. Our letter was out Monday morning before 10 a.m. with about 500 well-known CEOs who had signed it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and by the way, we had collected those signatures in, like, less than a day on Sunday. It was crazy. Um, and... I think that is an important message. It sends about this community, about what their belief system is. It, it tells others, um, either in other cities or other states or other countries, you know, that we in New York, we in the tech community, we still want you here. That, you know, what this administration is doing, particularly with regard to immigration, but other things as well, doesn't actually speak for all of us. Did it change the policy? No. Do I wish it had changed the policy? But, but did it not? Because it did get changed. Well, it did. And, it, and as a matter of organizing, which yeah. is probably a little bit different than this conversation, but as a matter of organizing, that group of tech companies went on to sign multiple amicus briefs in the Supreme Court. Um, it's a group of people who've stayed engaged uh, in, in subsequent issues, not just immigration that have come up, things like net neutrality, for instance, other issues that, that impact this community, um, and immigration more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond the travel ban, things like DACA, um, et cetera, uh, family separation, but that was kind of a separate conversation. Um, and, and it has shown, I think, uh, where the community of entrepreneurs, of innovators, where they fall on the spectrum, on the political spectrum. And I think that's been incredibly meaningful. Um, and I have to take exception when you talk about uh, the Bay Area and Route 128. Where was New York City? <laughs> we are number two by any um, by any any measure. And in fact, you know, I think that a lot of what New York has to offer when we talk about innovation and technologies is the best that you see in the country, if not the world. And, and I can uh, hopefully later in this panel talk a little bit about what the city and the state and the community has done to drive that. Let me just push a little bit on it, just because I'm curious to know, is um, of, the, of the signers, was there any vulnerability given some of the CEOs of some of these companies that haven't been exemplary yeah. citizens, uh, the, the Travises of the world from Uber, yeah. there was a backlash on him. You know, how vulnerable are you um, as to the personalities? Um, I don't think we are vulnerable. You know, listen, at the end of the day, these are people running big companies, and you can take exception with what they do um, running their companies or on other issues, but especially when you're talking about immigration, um, I can't think of another industry that, to my mind, has a better track record on, on immigration as a policy matter. Um, I don't think there can be any Travis signed the letter. I, Uber's always been great on immigration, you know, no matter who was CEO. Um, and I think that I have some theories as to why that is, and I also have some theories as to why the letter was um, so popular, you know, it was, it was so attractive to a lot of these CEOs. A, a couple quick points on that. Number one, a lot of the CEOs of tech companies, particularly in New York, but nationwide, were literally in high school when George W. Bush was president, right? Their, their companies had only existed in an Obama administration. Um, in New York, you know, Mike Bloomberg administration, you know, now, of course, that's changed. Um, but, but these CEOs, they didn't know in many ways how to exist in a world where maybe they didn't agree with the political powers that be, obviously, in, in the administration. Um, 
And so what does that mean? And I think a lot of these folks are kind of saying, well, what can I say? How far can I go? Is he going to tweet something about me? What can I do? And I think the letter, which while it was strongly worded, if you go back and read it, was also quite respectful intentionally. Um, and it gave these folks some political cover. I think they finally felt like, oh my god, I can finally say something. I can finally make my voice heard and not take on tons of professional risk for my company. Particularly, so many of these companies, it's in the internet age, whatever you want to call it, they have customers all over the country, not all over the world, all different political persuasions. And I think a lot of these people, are, you know, they're really disappointed in the current administration in, in the White House, but they also don't want to alienate their customers, their stakeholders, their shareholders. So like where, you know, finding that path, and I think the letter gave them that path, many of them for the first time, and I think they felt uh, quite relieved. Robin, well, over to you. So some of the challenges that, that we see within the tech community is the access to talent, access to capital, and the commercialization of new ideas and being able to foster them and give them the necessary capital to be able to, not only from a research and development, but also to bring them to full fruition to be into startup and, and, and high growth startups on, on a scaling basis. You run the Venture Capital Association. You, um, and there has been the access to capital. 2% um, only go to female founders currently. 8% are female partners within the venture capitals. What is the venture? Then there's been this incredible awareness. Arlen Hamilton on the on the cover of Fast Company, um, really trying to make you know diversify and have more underrepresented. Talk to me a little bit about what the venture capital community is doing to actually increase that access. That's a great question because it's so important. If we don't have diverse investing teams, we're not going to get access to the most diverse and talented entrepreneurs. The companies are not going to have insight into diverse customer bases, et cetera. So it's, it's hugely important. So if you look back on the venture capital industry, the modern day venture capital industry largely was born in the 70s, and it was when a couple of things happened. First of all, there was a change in the so-called prudent man rule that allowed pension funds to be able to invest in alternative assets. Secondly, there was a drastic change in the capital gains rate in the 70s that brought it down, which led to incentivizing long-term capital formation. And so this little small cottage industry that sort of grew up and then had an explosion in 2000 around the dot-com era, it, it, it sort of has now, I think, been in a state of self-reflection. We came out in 2016, and we had looked at studies, and most of the studies that have been done about demographics in the venture capital industry were literally, and I'll admit this, they were literally interns going and looking at pictures on websites to determine what the demographics of the industry. So we partnered with Deloitte in 2016. We did a human capital survey. You can go to our website today. There's a nice dashboard. You can look at it by geographic region. You can look at it and, and slice the data in other ways. And our intention at the time, and we are about to follow through on the next step, was to repeat this every couple of years. And so we are now going back with Deloitte into the field with a comprehensive survey to make sure we understand exactly what the demographics are. Uh, I, I can't tell you the results because we haven't even uh, begun the study, and we will probably come out the first quarter of next year. But I would say that since we created the Diversity Task Force in 2014, since we have rebranded our efforts more recently into something called Venture Forward, which includes the activity around making sure we have a good sense of exactly what the demographics are. We've also tried to spur a lot of other activity. So we have convened entrepreneurs, limited partners, general partners in VC firms. We have put together um, partnerships with Twigo Foundation. We have reached out to groups uh, when the sexual harassment issue hit our industry, as it did many others. We convened, uh, I personally had conversations with the women who had, were affected and who came out publicly. And we, we got them all together and we said, okay, what can we do? What are the steps we can take? We know this isn't something that we're going to solve overnight. We know it's a marathon, not a sprint. Do you think it would have changed without the Kleiner Perkins lawsuit, without the memo coming out of Google? Do you think the venture capital would have changed? I think, uh, I mean, to the Kleiner, I think that helped. 
I think a lot of, uh, you know, unfortunately, when bad things happen, sometimes it leads to change. I think that, at least from my perspective, I started in my role exactly five years ago, September 2013. Uh, by the beginning of 2014, we had you know, been talking about, okay, we need to get a task force together. We need to get folks that care about this. We are, are hearing about it, but we're not doing anything. And from the way I grew up and spent now almost 30 years in Washington, you can either be part of the solution or part of the problem. And I wanted to make sure, at least in my tenure at NVCA, that we are part of the solution. So I think it, were, it was a lot of factors that came together. But I think it's too important for us not to continue to make strides and advances. And I, I think we are. I mean, I'm optimistic that this next iteration of data is going to show some improvement. At least anecdotally, I know of a lot of situations where firms that even almost celebrated the fact that they're never going to add another general partner have added another general partner. And they have been somebody that doesn't look like them. Congressman, do you think the venture capital industry has gone far enough um, to increase the diversity and having more non-white male, for lack of a term, um, you know, having that access to capital? Or do you think this is something that legislators should be taken, be fixed, or be pushed forward legislatively? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I have a particularly good answer to your first question. I mean, I read the same reports and, and, and newspapers that, that all of you do. Uh, it does appear to be a very uh, male, at least, um, oriented industry. Um, the second question is a little easier to answer. Um, the I don't think there's much of a government role in there. And, you know, I understand there's legislative efforts in California to require gender parity and other things on boards of directors. I, um, I would like, this is going to sound strange coming from a Democrat, I would like that to happen organically. Uh, and maybe it's not happening nearly rapidly enough organically. And in that case, limited partners and others have a real role to play. But the heavy hand of government always produces unintended consequences. And so I'm pretty skeptical of the idea of the government trying to fix these problems. Uh, can we do stuff to help? Of course we can. We should make sure the capital markets are stable and functioning. We should make sure that the bankruptcy system works really. I mean, there's lots of stuff that we can do, but I'm not sure, you know, close-in social engineering is of this type is really going, that this is the best way to get that done. And, and Julie, you work, uh, again, back at, this, at the city level and, and state. Are you seeing, um, do, how do you make sure and ensure this access to capital is, is reaching all entrepreneurs? And how do you, with a public-private partnership, kind of work to be able to solve for that issue without the heavy hand of government coming in? Well, actually, the New York City government's doing something very interesting right now, and not from the legislative, not from the heavy-handed side of things, from the helpful, <laughs> all boats rising side of things. They've launched a program called Women.NYC, and they're actually putting real funding behind women entrepreneurs um, in the tech space, but also kind of in the more you know mom and pop store from business space. There's, I believe, five million dollars earmarked for women filmmakers. They're really kind of putting their money where the mo their mouths are, and that's amazing. Um, most cities don't sit on the kind of money that New York City sits on where they can find that. And there's a ton of public-private partnership money, you know, because so many businesses here have money to contribute to those efforts. Um, but, you know, more broadly, outside of just New York, um, kind of, again, echoing on what the congressman said, we're seeing a lot of efforts that are happening without government uh, weighing in, like all rays, which is a big effort that came out originally of the Bay Area, but now there are women VCs from all over the country uh, who are part of that. There are, they do office hours, I know, in the Bay Area, and here where women VCs meet with women entrepreneurs. We've got some amazing funds here, uh, Founders Fund and, um, or I'm sorry, the Female Founders Fund and Built by Girls are two at the top of mind where women investors investing in women um, there are obviously there are more conversations around diversity, not that apply beyond just women, of course, but focus on that. We've really seen the community. Are we there? No. Do we have so far to go? Absolutely. Are these things a step in the right direction? Yes, without a doubt. It's been really encouraging to see the community come together in many ways. Let me ask you, but you, you uh, as you look into your, as you look forward into the next session, what do you think is the 
what is the one issue that you said if this could be changed, it would have a radical shift in either how we do, uh, how venture capitalists um, give out capital, or could be a fundamental change to spur that innovation? What's that one thing? If you could have that magic wand, ask the congressman here <laughs> sign, it, or sign this law. It's a great question. I get that from my board all the time. They say, you know, rank the order of priority of policy. And I say, well, that's that's great for us to think about what's most important for us. But unfortunately, we don't set the calendar. We don't set the agenda. The members of Congress do. So we have to react. I would say if there was one thing, it's not really a particular issue because there are several top issues. We've talked all day about immigration. We've talked about the fact that we don't have a startup visa in this country where other countries have that. So for, you talk about merit-based immigration. How could you have a higher merit-based immigration than an identified entrepreneur who has the financial backing of professional investors, who is going to start a company, who is going to create economic activity, who is going to create new jobs, and there is no way today for that entrepreneur to do that in America. The fact that we don't have that is appalling. We heard it on the earlier panel. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> and and you know, the reasons in, that we could spend a week talking about why it doesn't happen, I mean, the fact is there's bipartisan support for specific legislation to do that. There is not, however, a will to tackle the broader immigration issues. And the way Washington typically works is, if there's an area that everybody's in agreement, well, that's a bargaining chip for the area where there's disagreement. And there's a lot of disagreement on border walls and on illegal immigration and on going from 45,000 refugees to 30,000, which we heard earlier this week. So, you know, that's an issue. There's tax policy. There's an R&D tax credit that if you're in Canada, it's refundable. They get it. If you're in the U.S., it's not. I mean, now, thankfully, you can offset payroll tax uh, for R&D tax credit. But the fact that we still think about a tax credit means we're still not getting it. A startup is not in a tax-paying position, and they won't be for some time. We often, so uh, let me answer your question this way. If Washington would do one thing, and that is every public policy that it's considering, if it would simply ask itself, how does this positively or negatively impact new company formation, startup activity? Because the reality is most of the time when Washington looks at something, they're looking through the lens of a large incumbent company. And it's the unintended consequences of how it impacts the startup ecosystem. So if there was one thing, it would be every single time you have to take into account, does this help or hurt the startup ecosystem? In, in Congressman, in, in 2008, I was working for Senator Reid uh, at the height of the financial crisis, or when we first were getting inklings from Secretary Paulson and uh, Bernanke what was about to occur. I remember we were in a meeting, and the first question Secretary Paulson asked was, who, who in the room has ever traded a derivative? Not a hand goes up. Who's worked on Wall Street? Not a hand goes up. And he said, so we're in a theoretical exercise here. There is nobody here with practical experience about what we are about to go through and try to find the solutions. And basically all 40 people in the room nodded their head, yes. Talk to me, not to disparage any of your colleagues, but what, what is the, what is the, what is the practical sense? Do they have the sensitivity that Bobby is talking about to be able to understand from the mind frame of, of the consequences of the regulations or what they're proposing on the effectiveness of small and high growth startups? Um, I do. Uh, a number of members of Congress from California and other coastal progressive communities do. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm almost chuckling to myself here because, uh, look, I'm, I'm the poster boy for why Democrats lost the Midwest with my fancy Ivy League education living in Fairfield County, hanging around with all of you folks, right? Listening to statements which I totally agree with, which is Congress should consider first and foremost how its actions act on startups. You have any idea how that plays in Youngstown, Ohio? 
Um, one of the most transformative things I've done, uh, just because I am the poster boy uh, of how the Democrats got this wrong, um, was spend some time with Tim Ryan in Ohio. And I was so outraged when uh, the president in his inaugural address talked about American carnage. And Tim Ryan said, no, 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 come see my towns. Every third house is empty. Half the people have an opioid problem. Can you imagine telling those people what we're really going to do is figure out a fully refundable way because startups aren't paying taxes? This is why we lose elections. This is why if we, and by the way, I agree with that completely. But my point is, and I do have a larger point here, which is if it's not that we're dumb, um, some of us are, um, it's that we are responsive to the mood of the country. And uh, the country is a lot more than New York City and California and Seattle and the vibrant startup community in New York City. Um, and so what I would challenge, if you seriously want Congress focused on offering its largesse to startups, remember the folks in Youngstown, Ohio, f the things that I take it for granted and all you take for granted are good things, immigration and trade. To them, that means the devastation of their communities. And on immigration, it's not quite fair, right? I mean, yes, immigration probably does displace certain jobs, blah, 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 but that's not quite fair. On trade, it's not quite fair either. But understand that this is where people are. So my, my offer to the community as I struggle to not be the poster boy for not understanding the concern that 7 out of 10 Americans have as their wages are stagnant and as they don't benefit from IPOs and et cetera, um, is the entrepreneurial community broadly defined from venture capitalists in New York to Google to Sergey Brin, you, you know, you, you really got to be thinking about innovative ways to bring people along, to explain that folks, and to demonstrate that folks have a stake in this. Because until that is felt, if I go even to Washington, D.C. in front of the Democratic caucus, and by the way, it would be no more understood within the Republican caucus and say Congress should do one test, which, and again, I totally agree with you, I don't mean to mock that point of view, but I'll get tarred and feathered, and you'd get even more tarred and feathered in the other party, you know, our president is the president because he understood this. So I'm really interested in ways, yeah, let's, 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 let's urge this um, along as a key American competitive advantage, but daggone it, until we figure out how to make the benefits of this incredible jewel that we have in this country more broadly felt, boy, are we ever swimming upstream, legislatively speaking. And Julie, do you coach other ecosystems? I mean, New York has been this incredible powerhouse, Silicon Valley, Boston, and, and New York, this incredible power, this powerful ecosystem that you built. Do you export yeah. that knowledge, or are you fine with just making New York bigger, better, and better? I well, listen, it, Professionally, it might be a little bit of the latter, but personally, it's definitely the former. I couldn't agree you know, more with everything you just said, that unless we make sure that all boats are rising, then frankly, what's the point um, to some extent? So I've actually spent a good amount of time in a lot of these startup ecosystems all over the country. And obviously, no one's done more of that than Steve Case and, and the rise of the rest. And you just need to look at what he's doing and, and you know, read the report that's coming out that we're all here to talk about. And we are starting to see those tides turning a bit. We have a long way to go, but there are pockets all over the country where we're seeing real startup activity. Um, and, and I think that over time, and yes, I do talk to folks in these cities a lot. It's usually a little bit more informal than I'd probably like it, but we're constantly all talking because there are things you can do to get it right, and there are things you can do to get it wrong. What's their biggest challenge? Is there a consistent challenge amongst all these ecosystems that they find is the biggest hurdle? Um, I don't know. If th there's not a consistent one, and I think that's actually really crucial. I think that the cities and the geographies we've seen succeed the most are the ones who were successful at building on uh, existing um, kind of uh, the, the, the good things that already existed in a community. So, you know, Nashville, where they have this really robust healthcare industry and really robust creative industry, well before kind of the tech boom, they've built on that, on those specific things. Um, and I think you need to look no farther than Detroit, which has since had a renaissance, but original. Like the fact that they built Teslas somewhere other than Detroit was a real loss for Detroit. Um, and now they're kind of getting it back, but they, they missed an opportunity. So it's the cities who saw the opportunities to build on what they already had going well that, that did well. And I think when you recognize that, um, it, it can go 
quite far. There's one last thing I wanted to add on. We haven't talked yet about opportunity zones, yes. um, which seems really relevant to what you were saying, and there are actual policies moving. Um, I'm probably not the best one to talk about those. I think you two probably are more knowledgeable <laughs> than I am. <laughs> but, and, and actually, that was the last question, and I'm going to open it up for the floor as well. Um, and, Congressman, you did accomplish something great in the tax bill. You want to, uh, and there's all, a lot of individuals I know that are studying on the real estate management and other things, so I think they would be very curious kind of uh, why, what was the part, uh, why the opportunity zones um, got passed and what is the regs going forward or what are some of the issues you see that the regulators need to address? Yeah, yeah. So the the, uh, the tax so-called tax reform was not all bad. It had a, it had some good stuff in it, um, including that, and that I think was uh, is was 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 I hope pretty amazing. And, and this is not a new concept, right? This goes back to uh, revitalization zones and the uh, you know tax credits and uh, new markets tax credit and that sort of thing. And I, I think probably people are familiar with it. The idea is that you can actually get a very favorable tax treatment on investments that are made in those census tracts that are that are that are struggling. And um, fingers crossed. Uh, I mean, I, I, I hope that that is a good way to address the concentration uh, of innovation and venture capital and all that good stuff in, in certain geographies. I really hope it is. Um, and it'll be my test case, right? Because at the end of the day, if it's successful, that'll be great. Um, but let's also remember, based on my, my last speech, that it's also a dramatic tax advantage for investors. And uh, again, I think the I think people will, will celebrate that, provided that the actual effect on the ground in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and the Bronx, and, you know, other places like them really is, is transformative. And, Bobby, when you, uh, your members, when they look at the Opportunity Zones, how are they viewing this? Is just simple tax shelves, or do they actually want to make a difference as, as far as jobs and creation? And it's a long hurdle. I mean, that's one of the challenges. It's a long path. Yeah, I mean, for those that heard the panel before, you have a sense of how difficult venture capital is. So your first obligation is to those that entrust you with the resources to provide a return. I think, secondly, there is an increasing, and you know, this is something that uh, I, I know Ian wants to get into when he looks at more data, but it's thinking about uh, there's a difference in the dollar amount and the number of companies. And if you actually look at, just inside the U.S., if you look at the number of deals, particularly from California firms outside of California, it's about half. It's just that it gets totally skewed because what we continue in data to count as venture capital is largely not really venture capital when you're at a Series G and it's, you know, basically some big either sovereign wealth fund or some mutual fund or somebody coming in. It still gets counted a lot of times as a venture capital deal because it was originally venture capital back. So there, there are a lot of bright spots. I think VCs do care a lot about other places. I think they recognize, and now you're starting to see the articles about how, and I hear it anecdotally from my members all the time, as soon as they fund a company in the Bay Area, they're trying to figure out how to move that company to someplace that is more economical to, to grow. I, you know, I, I, it's probably still more economical in New York than it is the Bay Area for a lot of startups. So it's coming from Arkansas. It's a weird thing for me to actually say out loud. New York's more economical. But it is, it's true. I think they, they do care about this. They, they want to be helpful. But it really it takes a full ecosystem. So listening to all, you know, this panel and the previous panels, to me it's thinking about, we, we heard about angels. You need angel investors. You need people to, you know, let somebody take a risk. Then you need institutional capital. It's usually good to be around a university where there's great research and where there's talent pools and where there are a congregation of people. You need to have the right policies, like Julie was talking about in New York. You need to have the right policies in Washington. By the way, they don't all have to be about tax issues and, and be something that costs dollars. It can be policy issues. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we fought in the major tax reform bill was the idea that they were going to, and there was a, a tax implication, but they were going to change the point in time when you paid taxes on stock options to be at the point of vesting. Can you imagine the havoc that that would wreak on the entrepreneurial ecosystem, which largely has to compensate employees and people to work there by stock options rather than, than cash compensation? I mean, there are little things that can be done that don't cost money, 
but we've got to make sure we're all working together. With that, let me open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions for this panel that they would like to ask? While people are coming up, Penny, can I say one yeah, thing? Sure. Uh, Congressman Heim said uh, the same thing to me a couple weeks ago, and I, I appreciate it. And I, I do think there are ways that we, all of us, both sides of the aisle, uh, folks in the industry as well as policymakers, can talk differently about getting to the right policy. And it's about creating economic opportunity, whether it's in opportunity zones or elsewhere. There are a lot of public policies that should be considered to create more economic activity for the Youngstown, Ohio's, for the places that are so economically distressed. Hi, my name is John Fish. I've been teaching at SPS for more than 15 years. And Congressman, you talked about the heavy hand of government, as, and you brought that up. I, I, like to mention some things that might not be heavy-handed. Uh, for the first time at NYU, we were required to do anti-harassment uh, training and setting up safe workplaces, setting up safe educational environments through Title IX or Title I funding and EEOC regulations and ensuring that they're enforced is a way that workplaces, including the Houses of Congress, can make a safe workplace for women and other people who are in underserved and non and protected group classes so that they can go into a venture capital fund and not feel it's a boys will be boys or congressmen will be boys. And that's something that's not a very heavy hand and can be done with the types of policies that I'm sure you're already recommending. Yeah, thank you. Great, great observation. I'll just respond very quickly. Um, uh, one area where government should exercise a very heavy hand and has exercised a heavy hand is in ensuring a level playing field. Um, you know, you could argue that the civil rights movement and the actions of the Department of Justice in the 60s, I'm sure people did at the time, that that was a heavy hand. It was exactly the right thing to do. Uh, Title IX is another great example. I get a little more skeptical when uh, particularly large governments, like the federal government, try to say, you will achieve this outcome at this time. Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, at least want to examine the probability that that will achieve its, uh, its desired outcome. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, by the way. There's no institution, including the one I work in, that, uh, that shouldn't be sort of inwardly focused right now as we as all of these issues uh, um, uh, come to a head. So, so I, I do think government, uh, one of the great things about this country is, is things like Title IX, like the Civil Rights uh, Movement, like marriage equality, like these things that government has done to create a, uh, a, a level playing field. Um, so in that area, I would say a heavy hand is absolutely warranted. Um, but again, it is legislating to outcomes on a timeline that a bunch of people in Washington think is the right timeline that could that could wind up with uh, you know un unintended consequences. This is not exactly on, on point to that, but I, something that I think is important to the conversation more broadly that didn't that I didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, there are things that that when you think about from a policy perspective are incredibly important. Um, two that come to mind that have been incredibly successful here, I think. Um, number one, we talked briefly about infrastructure, but the subway, public transportation, it, for all the problems it has and they are real right now, has been, I think, the, probably one of the single most important things that has allowed the ecosystem to thrive here. Uh, when you think about things like affordability, part of the reason New York is more affordable than the Bay Area is because you can live farther out and get to work without driving. Like that is transformative. So when you know when you think about the heavy hand of government or however you want to talk about it, there are these. You know, Public transit makes a huge difference. Um, direct flights to where the investors are makes a huge difference. The other kind of policy area um, that I think we really need to spend a lot of time on, of course, is education. Um, you talked about Congressman kind of how the new Dems are thinking about that, but but also it, teaching computer science, like. We talk about it all the time. It's incredibly important. Um, in New York City, you know, there's an $80 million public-private partnership right now to do that at the uh, K through 12 level, and the state just earmarked $30 million to do that. So 
it's happening, it's not happening quickly enough, but we're we're moving that direction. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make one other point here, which is um, uh, when we're thinking about government um, uh, going after social problems, um, it's also important that we um, take the time to really understand the problems. Let me give you an example. Um, there is no better applause line, and there is nothing, well, actually, let me not be uh, exaggerating here. There's no better applause line, and, and certainly one of the most important things we can work on is wage equality. And when I'm in front of a group of people and I say it is unfair that women make 74 cents on the dollar for every, you know, for working the exact same job, that's actually not true. Um, there, it's a much more complicated problem. So when we do Lily Red Better or mandate that men and women be paid the same for the same job, that's important and it's true and we should do it. But it, if that's all we do, what we've now ignored is the single, is much larger drivers for what the fact is. The fact is when you look at wage inequality, um, a, the much larger than sheer misogyny, which is part of it, is the fact that women, for a variety of reasons, uh, choose or are forced into professions that are less compensated than men. We've been talking about venture capital as an example. So if all we do is pass a little lead better, which I'm enormously proud that we did, it lets us off the hook in struggling with the question of, wait a second, what are the larger stru structural reasons? Is it daycare? Is it educational opportunities? What are the larger structural reasons that um, make this complicated and that are actually driving some of these societal, you know, these societal problems that we have? So it's important as we think about what we do to not lose the complexity and be willing to get away from the applause line and, and, and get into the truth of what is driving. So I don't begin to understand, I've never really looked at it, why women are underrepresented on boards. I don't really have a good feel for why women are underrepresented in venture capital. Uh, I'm sure that old boys clubs and misogyny has something to do with it, but my guess is that it's a much more complex problem than just those things. Well, thank you, and uh, we're getting the hook. Uh, we are out of time. I know we could uh, continue this conversation. Um, as, as everyone alluded to, there are so many different areas and so many layers of this onion to peel back, and many, many challenges and many, many issues. We have 51 days to have perhaps a new makeup um, in Congress, or at least change the numbers here and there. But um, I know this conversation will, con will continue um, as we all struggle and work to find more solutions to this. So thank you to the panelists for coming today and I believe that I'll turn it back over. Thank you.